Sí. Sí, muy buenos, muy buenos días. Good morning. Just a few words to welcome all of you to this uh, opening of the exhibition, The Art of Clara Peters, organized by the Prado Museum together with the Royal Museum of Antwerp, sponsored by the AXA Foundation and with the collaboration of the government of Flanders. With this exhibition, we start to present uh, a long and narrow uh, series of exhibitions. And I think today's uh, entree is a very nice one. This is the first exhibition dedicated to this painter, not just in Spain, but in the world. It's interesting that as a woman artist specializing in one of uh, the uh, genres par excellence, well, it's quite paradoxical that uh, this genre has not deserved uh, such attention to date. Besides, the most important works of the artists are here at the Prado Museum for super, superb uh, paintings uh, from Clara Peters, uh, that were acquired by Philip II and Isabel de Farnesio. With this extraordinary works, Alejandro de Lara has uh, created a wonderful pantry made up by the uh, best uh, known works of Clara Peters. It's a very material art, very precise, detailed, realistic, although I'm sure Alejandro will explain better than me the way uh, we understand uh, realism. When we decided to organize this exhibition, I wasn't aware that it was the first uh, exhibition dedicated to a woman artist in our museum. We're very happy that this is the case, not only because of what it means from a gender point of view, but also because of the quality and rarity of the art of this European painter. I was particularly fascinated by her self-portraits, which, uh, as if they were footprints on the scene of a crime, show her presence amongst the objects uh, that she paints. With the same discretion as uh, the painter had, we have but decided to dedicate this to our dear colleague Clara Quintanilla, who has just retired, one of the great restorers of the Prado Museum, a creature, as John Preeley said, that was born uh, to restorate. Apart from the coincidence in name, Clara was asked to restore, amongst many other works in our collection, which include the Meninas, she was also asked to restore the works of Clara Peters in El Prado. So I think she deserves a recognition and a big round of applause. A small project like this has required uh, a lot of support support from the museums and collectors who have lent uh, their valuable works, also the collaboration of the government of Flanders, which has allowed us to have uh, the translation into several languages of the catalog. We have with us the Minister of Culture, Sports, and Youth from the government of Flanders, Mr. Sven Gatz, whom I'd like to thank for his collaboration and his presence here today and also Andre Hevelin, a delegate of the Flanders government in Madrid. I also want to thank the AXA Foundation, which uh, this year has sponsored the two great exhibitions dedicated to Ingress and George de la Tour. And they sponsor this uh, very unique project as well. I have the honor of giving now the floor to Jean-Paul Rignon, president of the AXA Foundation and a patron of our museum.
Thank you. Gracias, Miguel. Thank you, Miguel. Good afternoon to one and all. Today, I will start by confessing something. It is always a pleasure for me, as chairman of the AXA Foundation, to attend the event that we organize uh, together with the Prado Museum. But today, as Miguel said, the opening of this exhibition is very, very special for me. I recently became a member of the Board of Trustees of the museum, and for me it is a great honor to be a member of the greatest uh, museum in Spain. The relationship between AXA's foundation and the Prado is a friendship that is about to celebrate its uh, 20th anniversary. But in spite of this long friendship, every time I come, I'm uh, pleasantly surprised by the ability that this museum has to organize unique exhibitions such as this one. It's not very frequent to find such a great uh, exhibition dedicated only to the work of a woman painter. But today we have this great opportunity. And for the AXA Foundation, it's a great pride to have participated in this uh, event. It probably wasn't easy for Clara Peters to become so famous in a world that was reserved for men almost exclusively. I can imagine her as a very enigmatic entrepreneurship and avant-garde woman who fought against the prejudice of a time in spite of her youth. And even though we, will, we can only discover her through her works, through her self-portraits, which Miguel uh, mentioned and which are present in some of her paintings, it is great to know about her life through her paintings. A small reflection of her small, great personality. We see objects that are used daily with an exquisite level of quality and detail. I don't want to speak any longer. I just want you to know that we're already thinking about the year 2019, the year of uh, when El Prado will celebrate its 200th uh, anniversary, and we will celebrate our 20th uh, year-long relationship with El Prado. So for the AXA Foundation, it's a great thing to be able to disseminate culture by the hand of the greatest museum in Spain with such a wonderful team. Thank you. Ladies and a warm welcome on my behalf also. As always, it is a great delight to be in Madrid. More specifically, when I have the honor to open an exhibition that pays tribute to one of our great painters. In the art of Clara Peters, because that is how we pronounce it in Flanders, El Arte de Clara Peters, you will encounter upon one of the few female painters of the 17th century. Whilst we know little about her personal life, we, can certain, we are certain she is a pioneer of still lives. And to date, 40 panels have been identified as being hers. Opulent ban banquets, you will see, delicious meals, floral pieces, and of course, still lifes with many objects with fish, cheese, poultry, luxuriously displayed on a table along with expensive crockery, ornate goblets, and gold coins. Still lifes are really her trademark. Her work is most notable for the elegance with which she presented fish. This is specifically an area that she, pioneer, that she pioneered and became notable for. One of her best still lives is Nuts, Candy and Flowers, a panel owned by Prado. 
Remarkably, the goblet and flagon show reflections, and you must look very well, but you can see it, show reflections of Clara Peters whilst painting. Clara Peters was indeed one of the first to include self-portraits in her artwork. By doing this, she discreetly referred to Jan van Eyck, who in painted a reflection of himself in Madonna with Canon van der Paale. This exhibition on Clara Peters was organized in Antwerp a few months ago at the Royal Museum of Fine Arts. And this exemplifies, exemplifies the great cooperation among the Royal Museum, Prado, and also Rokox House. I am very pleased that our museum in Antwerp is maintaining good relations with Prado. These efforts have led me to visit Prado for the second time now in two years. These relations reflect in loans, of course, between Prado and the Royal Museum. And in 2014, the Royal Museum for Fine Arts gave Jean Fouquet's The Virgin and Child with Angels on loan to the Prado Museum. In the same year, Ruben's Garden of Love was exceptionally moved to Belgium, with many thanks for that, more specifically to Beaux-Arts in Brussels, that was acting as a host during the renovations of the Royal Mu Museum. The exhibition Sensation and Sensu Sensuality, Rubens and His Legacy, reunited the masterpiece with early sketches from the Amsterdam Museum and with two drawings made by Rubens for a piece coming from the Metropolitan Museum in New York. This unification showed the evolution from ID to production and allowed visitors to crawl really into Rubens' head. Last, last year, I was fortunate to witness a different cooperation between the Royal Museum for Fine Arts in Antwerp and Prado for the loan of the Antwerp altarpiece, The Seven Sacraments, by Rogier van der Weyden. This triptych was one of the prime art pieces in, of this Flemish primitive during that exhibition. I am very proud that our Flemish museums are able to cooperate with leading museum, museums such as Prado. I very much hope you will enjoy Clara Peters. Thank you. Buenos días y bienvenidos. Good morning and welcome to one and all again. I will start with an anecdote. Some days ago I learned from one of the persons who brought one of the paintings to the museum in Washington, I learned the following. He told me that in the 60s, a couple of collectors and lovers of American art traveled throughout Europe, visiting all the great museums. And they came to, a pra to the Prado, where they saw four paintings by Clara Peters. They went back to Washington. They asked about the painter. They searched for information about her, and they found very little information, and very confusing information, too. They looked for information about other women painters, and they learned that not only there were very few women painters, but also very little information about them. So they decided to establish the Museum of Women in Art in Washington, which has been one of the lenders of uh, one of the paintings in this collection. I tell you this anecdote so that you can see how important it is to give visibility to an artist. And that's one of the reasons for this exhibition. Clara Peters was one of the few women who were able to work in the 17th century, one of the few ones to be represented in El Prado. So one of the reasons to have this exhibition at El Prado was to give her visibility. Just like uh, in the case of other women painters, we know very little about her. If you Google her name or read books, you will find contradictory data. Most of the data is wrong. No one has devoted enough time to this author to understand her artwork and her biography. But I'm sure that after this exhibition, because everything we do in El Prado has great echo, we will find new paintings attributed to Clara Peters, and we will learn more things about her from archives in the in Flanders, in the Netherlands, etc. So I'm sure in the next five years we'll learn much more about her. 
She dated her first painting in 1607. You see that it's a painting of a woman who was learning. She was probably 17 or 18 years old, not more than that. And her last painting was dated and signed in uh, 1621. We know that she painted for uh, very wealthy people because out of the six uh, paintings documented in exhibitions, Four are in Madrid, two in the Royal Collection of Philip IV, and two in the Marquesa de Leganés collection, who was uh, described by uh, Rubens as one of the great collectors. He had two paintings of Clara Peters in his collection in Madrid. She painted only still lives, and we can assume that she did it because it was a way of not being limited by the restriction imposed on women artists at the time. They could not uh, use uh, nude uh, models. Think about artists who were painting at the same time, like Rubens and Van Dyck, about whom we know a lot of study drawings, drawings that show that they painted or drew models, nude models. She couldn't do that, and so she had to devote herself to a genre that was considered to be minor at the time, although it has been considered to be very important uh, in the last 150 years. The way she painted her style is also quite new for her time. Since the last years of the 16th century, painters like Caravaggio, a little older than her, painted still lives, realistic still lives, painting objects that uh, seem to be taken from reality, that help us appreciate their surroundings, which were not limited to the idea that the raison d'etre of painting was to paint objects, themes that could help us reach uh, higher grounds. For the idealism of Baroque and Renaissance painting, this would remain to be a major style, painting things as they were. But some people thought, why paint something that is already there, that already exists? But this changed as of the 17th century, and Clara Peters was the first one to do it. So we see how these first generations decided what things they had to paint. They were the ones who invented the type of painting that they wanted to do. When you look at still lives, there are two questions that come to mind. One, the genealogy of realism and naturalism, which was done because ever since the 19th and 20th century, that style was considered to be particularly modern. And also, we pay a lot of attention to the symbolism of these paintings, what they, the objects mean as if it simply tried to say something very specific, as if there were always a message that has to be unveiled. We know there usually is, especially when we see inscriptions. But when you see texts of writers who talk about art in the 17th century, when you see inventories describing paintings, it's not very common for them to be described in symbolic terms. And only in a few cases, like in the census of Jan Bruegel, do we find a description about uh, portraits or paintings of senses? This was not the case with still lives. Clara Peter's still lives were described as something that we see, tables with objects on top. And the same goes with other still lives that are described by authors in the 17th and 18th century. So these paintings, the objects that we see depicted on them, probably had some association in the minds of their contemporaries, as is the case now with our cars or clothes or objects that we bring as a gift to a meal. So for example, what was probably the opinion of these objects of those who viewed them at the time? And we should think about them as such instead of uh, seeing them as paintings that had a symbolic message. Since she was a woman painter, one might think, looking at these tiny self-portraits, you see one here, there's up to seven in this painting. She painting herself holding the palette on 
in her hand. When we see paintings like this, we see a woman who wanted to learn. She wanted to show herself too, knowing uh, how discreet her role was in society. But she wanted us to see her, and when we see her paintings, we look for those small reflections. But the truth is, we know very little about her. We're a bit frustrated in our efforts. So what I've done in the publication that goes with this exhibition is to study the material culture of the time as we know it in Clara Peter's uh, paintings. When we see a painting like this one, painted on a wooden table, a large one, with uh, the sign of a guild, a painting of a 17th century that was exported from Antwerp as an article of luxury, we see the first till life of fish that was ever painted. Clara Peters was the first one to paint still lifes with fish. That's an important uh, position. Think about how new still lifes were, and painters had to decide what to paint. When we see this, we also see a type of food, which because of the religious culture of the 17th century, this was considered to be a meal for fasting days, up to three days of fasting per week. And these uh, were probably um, not uh, sea fish, but uh, other kinds of fish from the river or lakes. And when Spaniards go to uh, Flanders or to the city of Antwerp, when they traveled at the end of the 16th uh, century, they told us how wonderful it was to see that fish were alive in the markets, fish that were so live, and these were probably sold fresh, and that is why they were particularly uh, appreciated. Salt was also very valued. You see uh, some salt here, because you had to preserve uh, the food and uh, salt was very much appreciated and scarce at the time. Salt that came from the Troy, Troya Peninsula in Portugal, or from Crete, or from marshes in the south of Bordeaux, or from uh, cities like Salzburg. Salt was very much appreciated. That's why the word uh, salary comes from salt. And on tables, salt was shown in a silver container. We've all grown in our homes, at least in our grandparents' homes, with beautiful uh, salt shakers, even from a time when salt was not that uh, important or that appreciated. We also see a knife on the right-hand side painting. That knife was used to take the salt and put it on the plate. It also was a reflection of a status. When you were invited to a meal, you had to take your own uh, cutlery, and therefore people took uh, their best uh, cutlery to those banquets. They were also used as wedding gifts, and probably the ones that Clara Peters painted were wedding gifts. It's quite possible, although we're not sure. To the left, we see a painting from the end of the 16th century. Some people say it comes from the workshop of Sanchez Coelho, although it doesn't seem very probable. There's a painting from an anonymous painter, very large, that shows an impossible banquet. We see different generations uh, of the Habsburg family. We see Charles III, Philip II, Anna of Austria, which is the Archdukes, uh, we have a woman who governed uh, what is now Belgium at the time of Clara Peters, whose courtesan culture was reflected in her paintings. And we see many of the objects on the table that we also see in Clara Peters' painting, like, for example, a small salt shaker next to Charles V. When you want to know who's important, you look at where the salt shaker is. It's usually next to the most important person. We also see knives and forks. Uh, recipe books of the time said that forks in Northern Europe were effeminate. 
in Italy they use them, and the Hathorks also use forts in some of their, paint, their paintings. It was rare to use forts in an elegant banquet, and they would have probably used uh, Italian, uh, sorry, knives only. You can see that what was shown in a banquet were not just objects that were used, but those that showed the social status. In Clara Peters, we find things that are not real. They are constructions. They are fictions, fictions that emanate from that same culture. What we see she exhibited in his, her paintings are the same things you see in that piece of furniture, objects that would not be used during the meal, but that show what was the social status of uh, those who exhibited them. Cheese is a type of food that was uh, thought to be a luxury item in Flanders in the 17th century. We have a lot of information that tells us about the imports of uh, cheese uh, in Flanders. In a novel of Cervantes, uh, the protagonist ate uh, cheese from Flanders. And in 1622, we've read that 500 different cheeses of Flanders were eaten. So this cheese went to people uh, who were wealthy. And we also see a porcelain plate, a china plate, uh, that we know when it was made, what years it was made. I don't know what province they were made in, but a porcelain plate bluer than other plates that you will see in the exhibition, painted with lapis lazuli. The other ones originally were the same, but they were painted with cobalt uh, blue that doesn't survive time as well. Porcelain plates uh, also implied that you were a worldly cosmopolitan person. In the 17th century, they became very popular, especially in the Netherlands. There was a lot of trade of uh, China especially with the uh, Dutch vessels. But Clara Petters showed that the Habsburg uh, monarchs uh, collected a lot of uh, China. They received it from Manila and Mexico, and they arrived in Portugal and then by land to Madrid. Great porcelain collections, and we see many of them in Madrid. Many of them were given to their daughter, uh, Isabel Clara, Eugenie that ruled from Belgium, who had a crockery room in her palace. That porcelain can also be seen in Rubens, Schneider, Jan Bruegel the Elder, and also in other painters like Clara Peters that was not part of the court. But she painted the same material culture, objects that were connected to the world of the Habsburgs, such as this porcelain plate. The glass cup was a Venetian style made by a family that opened a factory in Venice. The uh, jar was made in Germany. These were jars that were used uh, to serve beer, for example. They were of a higher quality than the local ones. When we see a painting like this one, we see also a cultural product. I insist on how important it is to see still lives not just as a symbol of new realism, not only as part of the genealogy of naturalistic painting that brings us to the 19th century, but also as a window to a different way of understanding objects and which uh, shows a fascination for history and the past. This uh, bird we see here is a falcon, which is uh, a bird that was used to teach uh, people to go hunting and to hunt in the gardens of the royal palaces. Why paint such a bird? Well, there's a reason for it. We know that in 1612 and again in 1960, the art du uh, dukes uh, enacted a series of laws that spoke about maintaining the privileges of aristocracy. And they did it because they were at a time of crisis where bourgeoisie 
merchants from Antwerp who made a lot of money, they were starting to imitate the behavior of aristocracy, making those uh, customs less uh, exclusive. And they said that you can only hunt feather by feather. Only aristocrats could do this. So when we see this type of bird on a painting, what we see is a social hierarchy where the painter, and especially the collector of the painting, is telling us that the owner belongs to that part of society. In the 16th uh, century, there was great interest in uh, scientific illustration. And this interest had a lot to do with getting people used to seeing these uh, natural objects in paintings, what later on we would call still lifes in Spain. And this interest in painting natural uh, objects related to uh, natural history was particularly important in Antwerp. And they painted these drawings for books that were published in many other places of Europe. We see an illustration from a book by Leonard Fuchs, who was a scientific doctor from Basel, published in 1524. And what you see here is a drawing that illustrates a plant or a flower. And you also have the scientific description of that object and its medicinal properties. On the last page of the book, we see the illustration you see to the Right is a recognition to the authorship of the painters who worked on the book. On the left, we see a completely unknown person, and to the left, someone who is a bit better known. None of them were very famous, but they painted something that we recognize as a still life, as a flower arrangement from 15-something. Interest in this type of art was very characteristic of Antwerp. And it evolved until it became the origins of the uh, still lives. What you see on the left is a drawing of dragonflies where the body is drawn, but the wings are real. And we see uh, a hybrid uh, product between scientific uh, illustration and art. Images that try to be didactical, that give us information, but they also try to be beautiful and show the gift of the painter, his skill as a painter. We also see a box, which is very similar but very different. It's a silver box made by a wonderful uh, silversmith, Wenzel van Dinsel. We see a box where some writing elements were kept, and it was decorated by in vivo casts, castings. Again, it's an object that responded to the scientific interest in nature that was starting in Europe at the time, but making it look aesthetically beautiful. It's more or less the same thing that we see in Clara Peters' uh, work. This is an illustration made by the son of uh, Schnagel. These were very popular. And you see this combination of different views so that you could see everything clearly with all its properties, but also a geometrical arrangement, a symmetrical arrangement. The author in this hybrid uh, drawing was looking for harmony and beauty. And if you compare the two images, you can see that Clara Peters had the intention of doing something similar, and her art was connected to that of the previous generation. And one of the main intentions of this uh, exhibition and its uh, book is to show how these still lives were not just the beginning of a painting sculpture, but they were also the end of a proto-scientific and artistic current. Just like there was great interest in knowing nature at the time, there was also great interest in collecting strange objects from faraway places. What you see to the left is a drawing of a Neapolitan collection, 1599. Clara Peters was 14, 15 years old at the time. We see a lot of images like this at the time that show the interest in collecting different objects for artistic, uh, financial, scientific in reasons, or because they were the reflection of foreign cultures. 
We also see a type of painting that uh, emerged in Tantorp in 1604-1605 uh, that made this type of uh, collections uh, be considered real paintings, images inspired in reality, cultural reality, which was translated into art. Something very similar we find in Clara Pitter's uh, paintings, like this one in the exhibition. We see seashells from America, Africa, or India. Very exotic ones. We know that a lot of people in Europe collected seashells. This is a portrait of a collector from Amsterdam, painted by Holtius uh, in 1602, where he proudly shows his seashells that was the reason why Clara Peters uh, included seashells in his, her painting. And then we see a goblet that was produced mainly in Nuremberg, but which was uh, then produced in other parts of Europe, including Antwerp. Very valuable objects that Clara Peters also included in her works. We see a lot of gastronomic culture, a lot of food. There was lots of publications on gastronomy at the time, almost as much as today. It's almost impossible to study uh, taste in food because when people write about food, they don't tell us what they want. They talk about a type of diet or a type of product. They say this is healthy, this is not. But we can learn that artichokes was a type of food that was considered to be very exotic, at least until the end of the 16th century came from Africa, reached Europe through Sicily and Spain. They were considered to be very rare all throughout the 16th uh, century. We see them in paintings like this wonderful painting from, fifth, from the 16th century by Peter Bruegel the Elder. We see that one of the monsters that, she depict, that he depicts was a strange creature defined by that peculiar shape of the artichoke very strange for the time. In uh, 1573, when Archimbaldo was painted, where we see the sense of taste, where lots of eatable objects were painted, we see on the breast uh, the artichoke. Around uh, 1604, we know that these objects had become more common. We know some judicial documents, one of the many claims for, to Caravaggio because he had a fight with the waiter in a restaurant because he ordered artichokes and uh, the waiter brought them uh, fried in uh, butter or in oil and he didn't want them like that. We know that the Bishop of Liege also wrote a book of uh, recipes and he said that artichokes were essential in any kitchen. This is the last image I'm going to show you. I already spoke about the game uh, paintings and uh, the legislation at the time. When we see that top painting, when this uh, genre of hunting was invented, he turned it into a very successful one. And this was an illustration of the same loss. He was painting exactly for that same social class that wanted to reaffirm uh, their privileges because the world was starting to question them. And the same with this Jan Bruegel's painting, uh, which is also included in the exhibition. If you look at the painting carefully, you will see that Jan Bruegel, the elder, painted uh, many of the things that Clara Peters painted, for example, you see the head of a, of a boar. The legislation stated that you can only hunt feather by feather and fur by fur if you are an aristocrat, of course. These are paintings that tell us the same stories, that talk about the same things. What we see in Clara Peter's paintings, that's why I show, we've included this painting in the exhibition, she painted uh, the same reality, cultural and material culture, but they were translated into art in a completely different way compared to the favorite painters of the archdukes and the elite of the time. 
That is why Clara Peters was a very brave painter who went against uh, the norm. Finally, I'd like to say something about the aesthetic qualities of Clara Peters' uh, artwork. I have a feeling, looking at the exhibition and having spent over a year studying her paintings, I find, for example, how detailed they are, how carefully she painted everything. She painted uh, more than usual. When you see her paintings, you get the same feeling as you do when you read a book and you read a page that is particularly good and you don't want to turn the page. There are lots of corrections, in her case, millimetric corrections. So one may think it wasn't necessary to change that fisheye or some other elements in her paintings. She was a great composer, I believe. You can see it clearly in her paintings. For example, she tried to relate on this painting on the screen the green uh, color of a head of a duck with other colors. Uh, it's as if that bird uh, had been placed next to a seashell and another bird uh, with a similar colored uh, beak. It's like when we started to see porcelain in Europe. It was called porcelain. Porcelain is the name of a type of seashell in Italy because people were reminded of seashells when they sold porcelain at the beginning. And we see the same comparison in Clara Peter's work. I'm going to leave it at this. Just leave me one last minute to say that we're very fortunate. I feel very fortunate because I've been able to dedicate over a year to study the art of Clara Peters and material culture in the 17th century. It's been really exciting. And I owe this possibility to the director of the museum. It's really a luxury to work uh, in El Prado. They give us time to study the past, and they allow us to make uh, contributions to the history of art. I remind you that the Prado has the largest collection of Clara Peters' work. So it is our duty to do research in this area. And I also want to remind you of something that is obvious, which is that this is teamwork. And in this case, people like Alicia Suarez and Carmen Moraes from the Flemish uh, department and uh, the exhibitions department, they've really helped us a lot. Without them, our work would be limited. And uh, I also want to thank uh, people who have installed the works, Martha from the Publications Department, Lola, etc. Without their work, we would still do what we do, but we would do it a little worse. Thank you. Any questions? Yes? Microphone, please. We don't know. The question was, did she have any brother or relative who painted? No, we don't know. Usually, when a woman of the time painted, they were probably part of our aristocracy or daughters of painters, but in this case, we don't know. I. I had heard or read in some other book, well, it's very common. One of the problems when you study women artists is that they were not very much studied in the past, so we have to start from scratch to build their biography. But again, as I told you, now that we have this exhibition, I'm sure we'll learn more about her. This exhibition has also been uh, exhibited in Antwerp, and. I'm sure people will dedicate more time to doing research on Clara Peters. Any more questions? No? Well, that's all. Thank you.